morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Welcome to November's Ask Tom Database Security Office Hours. My name is Richard Evans. I'm going to be your host today. I'm a product manager of Oracle Database Security. And my co-host and friend, Peter Wall, is going to join us for the uh, his presentation on Oracle Key Vault 21.5 New Features and Updates. If you've joined us before, welcome back. If you have not joined us before, Welcome. This is a monthly call where we talk about Oracle database security, product development, kind of what's going on. Each session will have a product announcement, some upcoming events, a technical context, which Russ will present today on Oracle Key Vault. I put QR codes all over this presentation. Hopefully it makes it easier for you to subscribe or get to some of our links here, but we hold these on the second Wednesday of every month at 10 a.m. U.S. Central even if that do, that time change does mess me up once in a while. But go ahead and uh, subscribe if you haven't. All right, some announcements today. Oracle released the quarterly patch back on or around the 18th of October. So you can see my Oracle support note 2118136.2 for patch numbers in more detail. And then I put a link in there to the October 2022 patch availability document. That doc ID is 2888. 497.1, where you can get information on the uh, patch availability for the Oracle database. And then as always, you can go to oracle.com forward slash security dash alerts for critical patch updates, security alerts and bulletins and what's going on with uh, Oracle product security. DataSafe, our cloud-based uh, solution has some recent updates. So we've got some target registration features that now allow custom listener ports for cloud databases. We've got some new filters on those security assessments to focus on findings for GDPR, STIG, CIS, and Oracle best practices. There's some new clickable graphs to improve the filtering around user assessments. And then our sensitive data discovery, our incremental discovery, and our sensitive data models all have all been updated to make it a little easier for you to identify and mask that sensitive data for your non-production systems. And then taking a masking policy and make changes and assign it to uh, a different target database there. So DataSafe is a fantastic solution where you can monitor, you can collect the audit data, and you can mask data for your cloud database as well as your on-prem databases. So DataSafe is always, always improving. And so we're excited to see these latest improvements with it. So for today's discussion, we're talking about Oracle Key Vault. There's a couple My Oracle support notes that you should be aware of. The first one is the primary note for transparent data encryption, TDE. It's 12280461. And the second one is the Key Vault Frequently Asked Questions doc, 2372010.1. And the QR code on the right has those doc IDs, so you don't have to write them down, but you can, you can snap a picture of that. You can go to our GitHub repository where we store these notes for every monthly session, okay? The Key Vault documentation, Peter Wall and... The team of doc writers do a fantastic job at trying to keep that up to date, but we do miss things. So if there's if there's a typo, if something is unclear, if the grammar is a little strange or like the section doesn't make sense, please provide feedback. We look at the these documentations uh, dozens of times a day. And so I miss things that have been there for a long time on the database vault documentation. You can download the patch to upgrade your existing Key Vault servers. That patch is 34024364. So you can go to Oracle support and upgrade your existing Oracle Key Vault servers. Or if you're installing Key Vault for the first time, you can get that from that e-delivery Oracle software delivery cloud for fresh installations. There's also Key Vault available in the Oracle Cloud Marketplace for your OCI tenancy. So if you want to explore, if you want to provision a new one where you've got one in the cloud, maybe one on-prem, you can work with that out of the Oracle Cloud Marketplace. And we have Oracle Live Labs that can help you with this. Peter's got a a video out there on how to deploy it in less than 10 minutes. I've linked that in the notes uh, GitHub page. So take a look at all this documentation that we've got available for you. Some blogs. We've got some recent blogs on blogs.oracle.com forward slash cloud security. So keep an eye on that. And again, here's a QR code that'll link you to that. Uh, incorporating a defend forward strategy, embracing the new norm for cloud security, audit vault, key vault, integration with Azure Active Directory, lots of good things that are going on with Oracle Database Security. And then some past events for Oracle Database Security Office Hours as well. So 
We've got TDE and Key Vault presentations out there for you. We've got a back to basics with TDE, using Key Vault with Exadata Cloud, a customer. In the spring, we did a Key Vault 21.4 new features event. And then we've got two out there on transparent data encryption, kind of advanced use cases that Peter and I did maybe a couple of years ago now. So parts one and two. And again, you can go to asktom.oracle.com and look at that, or you can click on the QR code and it'll take you to our notes and links. And we've got direct links to those presentations on that GitHub page. And again, if you want to get your hands on the products, we've got over 40 security related live labs out there. We've got Oracle Key Vault and Oracle TDE Labs. Now it's not the 21.5 release yet. We're working on that, but we've got uh, Key Vault 21 out there where you can get your hands on it and understand like how to use Key Vault, how to encrypt your database. And there's lots of really neat things that we've done on the Oracle Live Labs platform. And finally, hey, at Oracle Cloud World, you probably heard about Oracle 23C, our next long-term release uh, named App Simple for how many additional features and functionality we've added to make it simple to develop apps on Oracle Database 23C. If you'd like to, to be a part of that beta, there's a QR code on here, or you can go to tinyurl.com forward slash Oracle beta. You can apply to be a part of the beta program and, um, and get your hands on Oracle 23C. Give us some feedback. And there's lots of good security features on 23C as well. Let's go ahead and get over to today's technical topic. I would like to introduce Oracle Key Vault 21.5 to you today. And at first, um, I would quickly recap um, a little bit about TDE. So TDE was first released in Oracle Database 10GR2. And over time, we made encryption easier with every database release. And then, of course, when the cloud came along, you know that everything is encrypted in Oracle OCI. So we needed to backport a few features that brought the simplifications for TDE to the older database releases. And we will go over that in a minute. Right? So here on this slide, you see that even though TDE is a very mature product, our developers keep coming up with new ideas. So in Oracle Database 11.2 and 12.1, you see that we backported the offline encryption and also a setting that when you create a new table space and you don't specify the encryption algorithm, we still encrypt the table space. Oracle Database 12.2 introduced the possibility to do online um, table space encryption and online rekey. And we also introduced the separation of duties where you can hide the key store password from DBAs. In Oracle Database 18, we introduced the per PDB key store. We removed the dependency on environment variables by introducing the initialization parameters, wallet root, and um, TDE configuration. You can bring your own key into a wallet. And if you have an on-premise database that you would like to duplicate or restore into OCI, we have the option of encrypting those databases as they are restored or duplicated into OCI. And backwards. So if you have an encrypted database in OCI, but not a TDE license for your on-premise database, you can restore or duplicate as decrypted. So then your on-premise database is not encrypted. Um, in Oracle Database 19C, uh, we finally fully support to encrypt the system sysox temp and undo table spaces. In 1914, we made the per PDB key store available for everyone, everywhere, almost everyone because you need to have the enterprise edition and everywhere, meaning not, uh, not in other clouds. And in Oracle 1916, we introduced uh, split TDE and data guard. So when you have an on-premise database that is not encrypted because you don't have a TDE license and you would like to set up a data guard um, standby database in OCI, the standby database can be encrypted and the primary on-prem is not encrypted. So you will not need a TDE license. In Oracle 21C, um, our innovation release, um, we introduced database board command rules to control who can issue administer key management under which conditions. So there can be certain IP addresses that this user needs to come from or at certain times of the day. And um, Oracle DBCA creates encrypted databases and we can finally update the OKV endpoint software without a database restart. So those are the innovations that we had so far. Um, here's a quick overview on how TDE works. TDE has a two-tier key architecture. 
On the right side, we see the data encryption keys that are stored either in your table space headers or in the data dictionary. And those um, data encryption keys are encrypted with a master key. And the key encryption key or master key, same thing, lives outside of the database in the Oracle wallet or an Oracle key vault. Um, hardware security modules mm, cannot keep up with the load when you suddenly, instead of having one encrypted databases, you have thousands of encrypted databases, your HSMs will, they can be used to fry X, but not to provide key management for those databases. And that is why we do not support that. So of course, when you encrypt thousands of databases, the question comes, we need key management. And so when we came up with OKD, we basically started thinking, what are the most important aspects that we need to cover with the key management system? So we need to make it easy for our customers to rotate encryption keys. And we also would like to separate the encryption keys from the encrypted data. This is also a part of the PCI standard, right? PCI standard also doesn't allow you to keep your encryption keys on the database server. They need to be moved someplace else, for example, into OKV. Secure key sharing and archiving. So when you put your keys in OKV, they literally cannot be lost anymore because they're replicated across the cluster to all nodes and all your keys and secrets are automatically part of the OKV backup. Um, and we would like to enable secure sharing of keys because this becomes important when you have multiple database instances that access the same encryption key. So if you look at DataGuard, for example, your primary and standby database need to have access to the same encryption key. Um, the same is true if you have a REC database, all your REC instances need to have access to the same encryption key, which is used to encrypt the shared storage. And of course, we need to scale because this is what we need to do. Our customers don't have 50 databases. They have thousands, 10,000 of databases. And once all of them are encrypted, the load on a key management system is just overwhelming because it's Oracle database and Oracle keyboard. We need to handle this and we do. Right? And there are several features that I will show you in a moment on how we do that. So Oracle keyboard was invented uh, 10 years ago. And meanwhile, we are on the fourth main release after 12.1, 12.2, 18 and 21. So 21 is our fourth OKB main release. It's optimized to provide TDE key management for your encrypted databases. It can be installed as a cluster. And that cluster can span your data centers. It can reach into OCI. So you can basically put your OKVs where you want and you can run them on bare metal machines as a VM guest or in your OCI tenancy. So let me go through a few common Oracle keyboard use cases. As I mentioned in the beginning, it is optimized to provide key management for Oracle TDE encrypted databases. But also we try to constantly improve your cost of ownership for keyboard. So we put in <clears throat> more features all the time so that OKD becomes more useful for you. So for example, from the very beginning, we supported key management for Oracle Golden Gate encrypted trail files. Um, you can store, manage, and share database account passwords and Java key stores and private SSH keys. And I will quickly guide you through how this looks like. So here we see a keyboard cluster that was set up <clears throat> um, as a cluster. Nodes 1 and node 2 is a read-write pair. Node 3 and node 4 is a read-write pair. Everything that happens in either one of those um, peers will be replicated to the other read write node before your database prompt comes back. So if you do an administer key management set key command that creates a key, let's say an OKV number three, and only after the key has been replicated to number four is when you get your prompt back. So we are always waiting and we guarantee that your key is replicated to at least one more OKV node. And the replication between the read write pairs is asynchronously. So the, that's where Golden Gate comes into play. For the synchronous replication, we use DataGuard. And the nodes one and three do not need to be in OCI. They can be in your second data center on premise. So we mostly recommend our customers to stretch the read write pairs across data centers, but you don't have to. So that's up to you. Use case number two is that we provide key management for Oracle Golden Gate encrypted trail file. Um, the source and target of this replication service doesn't need to be an Oracle database. It can be anything. You could replicate from a Kubernetes cluster into Microsoft SQL Server, just as an example. And every time, Golden Gate will create trail files. 
Now, if your source and your target are encrypted, why wouldn't you encrypt your trail files? Right? Because they contain table data, data out of your applications that may be sensitive. So you would like to encrypt them, usually by default, or the Golden Gate uses a wallet, just like what the database does. And if you bring OKD into the play, this whole thing becomes completely transparent, introduce a new key into your Golden Gate system, then this key will be available on the replication side as well. So there is no, no more need to copy wallets around. It's the same thing with the Oracle database, right? If you don't have OKV, you will be copying wallets around and restart your MRPs and data card. This all goes away and your databases almost behave as if they were not encrypted. And the same thing is true here. When you encrypt your Golden Gate Trail files and you put the keys into OKV, this becomes so transparent, it's basically a lights out operation. Database account passwords. So let's, let's imagine that you have scripts that uh, log into your database every night to, to perform maintenance in your database. So there could be that you replicate um, data out of a transactional database into your data warehouse. You could be rebuilding materialized views. You could be rebuilding indexes. You can create an ARM and backup. All those things that usually run overnight or at times when the database is not too busy. And those scripts, of course, need a username and password to log into your database. Sometimes those accounts are very powerful. So you don't want this password to be lying around in your maintenance script on your hard drive. So for this, Oracle invented the Secure External Password Store, which allows you to reconfigure your database. And whenever the script connects with a certain user to a certain connect string, the database knows that it gets this password out of the wallet. So now from a security perspective, we removed the clear text passwords out of your scripts into the Secure External Password Store. But that does not address the management problem. If you change your database account passwords. You also have to update this password in your wallet. The wallet can be lost, it can be stolen, copied, encrypted. People do all kinds of things with wallets. And that is why we thought, hey, we need to put this into OKV. The benefit of this is that you can easily write a script that logs in every morning at three o'clock in your database and does, for example, an ARM and backup. And while the account is logged in, you change your own password and we upload this new password into OKV, but this password will become active only the next morning at 2.58 when your script logs in. And then when your script logs in, it does the Armand process or whatever it is supposed to do. And at the end, it changes the password again. So here we have a password that's only used once and it will be uploaded into OKV. The passwords can be very strong, very long, because humans never have to remember them. And this whole process, again, runs lights out. So you set it up once, and then it keeps running. And what you can see here is that the database endpoint has read-only access to the virtual wallets for password one and password two. So the databases in this example, it's a little different from what I mentioned earlier. Here we have a database account administrator who creates new passwords. And those passwords are then consumed by the endpoints. And for this, the endpoint have read-only access into the wallet. If you want your databases to change those passwords themselves, of course, the database need to have read-write access into a wallet. This way, we greatly simplified the management for the passwords for those maintenance scripts, for example, and also increased the security. And if you have seen the videos that I recorded earlier for OKV version 21.1.2.3, you will see that um, those commands now in OKV 21.5 are much easier. Everything that you need is available directly on the command line. In the old videos, you can see that I'm creating JSON files. I put them through a JQ filter. Um, I know that those of you who have tried to use JQ struggle with the same problem that I use to struggle with in the beginning is that JQ is literally not documented how it works. Uh, the learning curve is very steep. On the other hand, JQ is very powerful. So that's always the, the decision that you have to make. So in the old versions, you create a JSON file, you send it to a JQ filter, and then you execute the same command again, reading from the JSON file, then get your KMAP ID, get your password. This is now all <clears throat> directly available on the command line. So there are no JQ filters, no JSON files on this. It's so much easier. And of course, the response from OKV is faster, right? Because you have fewer round trips. 
So if you compare those commands to the commands that are used in the old OKV versions that are published on YouTube, you will see a big difference. Java key stores, um, that's another thing that you could manage <clears throat> um, centrally in OKV. So here, um, that was a demo system that we built for a customer. Um, they have uh, consuming endpoints that may have no internet connection for an extended period of time. So in this case, what we have done is we have an administrator who creates new Java key stores regularly, maybe every week, every month. And what we also do next to the Java key store, we store a timestamp in OKB. Because we do secrets management, we also store the Java key store password, right? The administrator creates everything. He creates a Java key store, he defines the password, and with it, we also store the current timestamp. Now on your endpoints, there is a cron job that compares the timestamp of the last created Java key store with the timestamp of a new one in OKV. And if those timestamps don't match, the, the cron job will automatically download the new Java key store. And as you know, when you download a Java key store onto your system, it requires a password. Now we have the password already in OKV. The script applies the password automatically. So on your disk, you have a password protected Java key store with a new timestamp and everything is automated. There's nothing that somebody has to do. When the administrator decides that he creates a new or she creates a new Java key store, this Java key store will be replicated automatically whenever the cron job runs on the endpoint machines. And if a user, let's say a developer, needs to access the Java key store, he can also apply the password out of OKV, meaning that he doesn't need to know the password. The client software can fetch the password directly out of OKV. And when we upgrade, you see this on the left side, we have a new Java key store and also a new timestamp. So the cron job will run and will notice that, oh, my timestamp doesn't match anymore. Let me get the new Java key store with the new key and the new certificate and a new timestamp. So now comes the, the sweetest thing that we have done in OKV 21.5. We greatly simplified on how you can manage private SSH keys for public key authentication. So the way that this works now is that we have an administrator who creates a private and public key pair. Those will be uploaded into OKV. And of course, the public key will be sent to that remote server to which Tom likes to connect. So after all, has been set up, Tom uses the same SSH command as is as if he would connect with the normal method where you have your private key on your hard drive. It's the same command, but in the background, we will load the representation of the private key, not the private key itself. The private key itself stays in OKV. And this is how we do this. So the first thing is you create a private and public key pair. Right? This is what the OpenSSL command does. It creates a private key. And then we upload this private key into OKB. And that's the difference to um, compare to the older OKB releases. Everything you do fits into one command line. There is no JSON file to be created, no JQ filters that are complicated. Um, it is so much easier. And so I'm using this command to also store the response from OKB into an environment variable called private key ID. So I have it available. So here I'm creating a private key. I'm uploading this private key into OKV and I store the, <clears throat> the unique ID that is the output from OKV uh, in an environment variable. The next thing is that we set up public key authentication like we did before. So for the public key authentication, you need to correct the permissions on the file first, and then you create a public key from the private key and copy command number three we copy the public key into your remote instance. And then just to test, you SSH into the remote instance, specifying with minus I, you give the address or the, the location of your private key, and then you log into your remote instance and we see this in step five. So this is the classic way, right? We're just testing if it works. And then the next part is that we create a PKCS8 public key. That's a little different. But again, we can create a public key in PKCS8 format from the private key, and we register the public key with OKV, referencing the private key ID. So OKV knows that this public key belongs to the private key because as you can see, there is a private key UUID that goes into this command. 
And again, uh, we could <clears throat> store the, uh, the response that comes from OKV into another environment variable. So now what we have done, we created a private key, we created a public key that goes into the remote server, and we created a different public key from the same private key that goes into OKV. So now all the keys are done. We can delete the key pair from the administrator's workstation because they have been copied to where we need them. And now comes the last step. So we delete the keys on the administrator machine. We export Oracle Home to wherever you have an endpoint without a password. That is very important. You need to have an endpoint with an auto open connection into OKB. And then we populate the SSH agent. What the SSH agent does, it caches the password for a limited time. Let's say for four hours, for eight hours, for 24 hours, the user has to type in the OKB endpoint password, not a password that protects the key. It's the OKB endpoint password. Only once, and then for his working day of nine hours, everything has been saved. So whenever he logs in, he doesn't need to give the password. But every morning that our user Tom needs to log into the remote machine, he needs to provide this password once. And we add this password um, into the... SSH agent, and because you have an auto open wallet, the password that it prompts you for is null, N U L L, not the brackets. And then finally, we can log in to our remote instance, that's uh, commands five and six. And uh, yeah, so there is no private key footprint anywhere, right? The administrator deleted the private and public keys from his server. And our user, Tom, who likes to log in to a remote machine, also has no private key on his machine. You can basically achieve key governance much easier because now you know where your keys are. They're only in OKV. And you can control with whom to share those keys or who do I grant access to this private key. It will be only Tom because it's a private key after all. So that private key associates a person with a private key, whatever that person does. Or when somebody steals that private key, the evidence points to the original owner because it's a private key. So you really want those private keys to be well protected and uh, you could put them into OKB and everything is automated. Um, in OKB 21.4, we introduced the non-extractable keys. One part of OKB's um, scalability is that we populate an in-memory cache and a persistent cache on your database machine. This cache is created, protected, and maintained by Key Vault on your database server. The PKSS 11 library knows where to get the keys the fastest. So normally we don't have to reach out to OKV. We can do the encryption and decryption of the data encryption keys on the PKSS 11 library on your database machine. And we get the master key out of the in-memory cache. If this has expired, the in-memory cache will be refreshed from the persistent cache. If this has been expired, we refresh the caches from OKV. So we only reach out to OKV when the keys are expired, not every time. This is one aspect of where the scalability comes from. But we have a few customers who are not happy with this picture. They would like to basically OKV mimic an HSM behavior. So now we no longer cache the keys locally. We send the data encryption keys over to OKV and get the decrypted data encryption keys back over an encrypted channel, of course. And then the database can use those keys to encrypt and decrypt the payload in your table spaces. Now, this puts a much, much higher load on OKV. And the reason why we can handle this is you can let an OKV cluster scale horizontally or vertically. Horizontally means you add more OKV nodes to your cluster. Vertically means that if you notice that, hey, since I used the non-extractable keys, the load to OKV became 500 times bigger. So I can no longer have my OKVs running in a virtual machine. They need to be installed on, on a dedicated server. You can do those extensions or um, adding of cluster nodes or relocating a cluster node from, let's say, a VM guest onto a bare metal machine. All those cluster modifications do not cause database downtime because we have a cluster. Right? You can do this node by node. And while this one node goes down, the other nodes will continue to provide read-write key management service to your encrypted database. Now, if you have an HSM, which we do not support. Let me repeat this again. We do not support HSMs for TDE key manager. But we, of course, we know that many of our customers already have an HSM and we can put it to good use. 
Um, as you can see, the, the keychain that we have from your encrypted table spaces, on the left side, we have a data encryption key and we have a key encryption key. That key encryption key of your database lives in an encrypted table space in OKV. Now, of course, this table space has a data encryption key and a master key or key encryption key. For OKV, this key encryption key lives in a wallet. Now, by default, if you don't have an HSM, this is an auto open wallet because we need the OKV um, appliance to come up all by itself and not prompt somebody for a wallet password. Um, so we have an auto open wallet. When you introduce an HSM into the picture, we delete the auto open wallet and we protect the password protected wallet in OKV with a random password. This random password is written into a file on OKV's disk and is encrypted with a symmetric key out of the HSM. So when OKV starts up and we have access to the HSM, we send the encrypted password file to the HSM, get it back decrypted over an encrypted channel, and we can read the wallet password, we can open the wallet and OKV can start. If I'm stealing your OKV, let's say your OKV runs as a VM guest, I can easily copy the disk image onto a memory stick and walk home. This is a matter of minutes. Of course, when I start this OKV at home, it will not have access to the HSM, it will not come up. So this is the ultimate protection um, that we can give you for our keyboard. This is how we can put HSMs to good use. We want you to use OKV in the middle to provide the heavy lifting for key management, but the protection of OKV and the extension of this crypto chain from your database to the HSM is seamless. Again, here is um, <clears throat> a summary of the use cases for Oracle Keyboard. If we start on the lower left side, um, of course, that's what OKV was built for, for TDE key management. OKV is built in or can be added into your provisioning screens for the autonomous database on Cloud at Customer, right? Because you don't have access to the operating system in the autonomous database. We need to do the OKV onboarding um, automatically. So what you do is you register your OKV on-premise cluster into OCI as a key management resource. And whenever you add an autonomous database, you can attach this key management resource to your autonomous database. And while the database is being built by OCI, it will be onboarded into your on-prem OKV cluster automatically. Um, for Exa database, on Clouded Customer, same thing. Currently, we have three MOS nodes out there written by a colleague of ours um, who goes through the migration of your wallet-based XRCC databases into an on-premise OKV cluster. Of course, we work with XR data and uh, pluggable databases. If you relocate a pluggable database from one container to the other, OKV greatly simplifies the secure sharing of the PDB keys from one container to the other. We have two different integrations into the ZFS storage appliance. First of all, you can put the OKV backups into ZFS where you can create non-modifiable snapshots. And we also provide key management for ZFS if you decide to encrypt the storage of ZFS. I would highly recommend to not do the same thing with the same OKV. So you cannot have one OKV, put the backups into ZFS and have that OKV also provide uh, key management. You shouldn't do that because you only need the backup when OKV is not available. When OKV is not available, you can also not access the ZFS. In ZDLRA, um, OKV plays a role when you replicate your databases from ZDLRA on-premise into your OCI tenancy. We talked about Golden Gate, we talked about secrets management, we talked about JKS, and we also have a C and Java SDK that allows you to basically leverage OKV for all your secrets or key management needs of your applications. So whatever your applications have to are doing in terms of sensitive information, passwords, encryption keys, 
tokens, secrets, whatever it is, you can put them into OKV, let OKV handle the secrets management and the applications will become slimmer because the security code is maybe easier. So that's also a great thing. And I mentioned we have a C and Java SDK. Uh, we also provide key management for third-party databases like MongoDB and of course for the Oracle MySQL. And that's it. Thank you. Again, these notes um, are available on our GitHub repository. There's the QR code for it.